something that hits pretty, pretty close to home for me. It is something that I have dealt with for the last year pretty steadily. It is something that if I am not careful, I am, I'm going to slip up and I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to fall into again. And it's something that I am working on every single darn day to be better at. And that is bitterness. And I can feel the heaviness in the room. Like, this is not one of those, like, jump up and down and wave flags kind of messages. This message is going to be a little heavy. This message was hard for me to write. This message is harder for me to share than any message that I've, I've shared with you before. I have tried to talk myself out of sharing this message every single way, including up until yesterday. But I, I think that this message is going to be something that is going to be therapeutic for me to share, but more importantly, it's going to help you. And so I want to start off by telling you I hate pranks. Pastor Larry tried to pull a prank on me literally right up until the moment that we came out. I, I always joke with the team about the water, and Pastor Larry decided to put a sippy cup on there. And because I have saved Tucker's behind so many times, Tucker did me a solid and sprinted back out there because he realized that something was awry and he grabbed that like a good soldier jumping on a grenade. So Tucker, I love you, man. Thank you. <laughs> Pastor Larry, just remember you are speaking next week and turnabout is fair play. But I hate pranks. I had a friend in college, uh, he lived next door to me, and, and he was in this like prank war by himself. Like nobody else on campus was a part of this prank war, but Justin thought that it was great to prank everyone. He, he blew an air horn the week of finals at two o'clock in the morning, which in itself is not jarring enough, somebody running up and down with an air raid horn through your dorm, but it like initiated this military style like shakedown and interrogation where they took us all over to the gym, and so we're boom, boom, boom. We're all in our underwear, we're a bunch of dudes, right? And so we're standing in our, our university gym, and they're like, did you do that? Who blew the air horn? I know you know. And it's like, dude, I don't even know what test I got to take in three hours. I don't know who blew this air horn. Justin tormented campus security. He would constantly put peanut butter or petroleum jelly or shaving cream under their door handles, so when they would go to grab the door handle, they would get a handful of whatever. He was a part of a raid of our assistant resident director's apartment because our assistant resident director took our cable box because somebody broke curfew. Yeah, you go to a Christian college, you have curfew. It's weird, I get it. But he broke into his apartment, and he didn't steal anything like really valuable. He stole his laundry detergent and like his cleaning supplies, like things that a guy in his like 20s at college doesn't really use anyways. And it was really fun when those things happened until they happened to you. And I remember going back to Circleville. Um, I was up here for the weekend. I, I worked at a church here in Newark when I was in college. And I remember getting back to the dorm. It's like 10 o'clock at night. And, and I go to open my door and I, creaker, creaker. Okay, maybe the key. So I jiggle the key a little bit and, creaker, creaker. What he had done is he had saran wrapped and cardboarded our doors sh shut. So nobody could get in <laughs> and nobody could get out. So, again, I hate pranks especially when they're pulled on me. So we waited about a month until Justin went home for the weekend, and literally probably 60 guys banded together to go to Walmart and buy every piece of saran wrap that they had. Your media director dove into a recycle bin outside of his library, pulling every piece of paper that he could out, and we went to Justin's room and we saran wrapped his shirts on the hangers. We saran wrapped 
his dresser shut. We saran wrapped his deodorant. We saran wrapped everything. We saran wrapped his bed, and then all of those pieces of paper that I meticulously dumped out of the dumpster went back to his room and into his bed, and then got saran wrapped shut. So again, Pastor Larry, you're speaking next week. (laughs) Be prepared, my friend. Now, you could say that was a grudge, but I'm not talking about grudges and bitterness like the, ha, 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 now let's, let's move on with our lives. I'm talking about something different, a, a grudge that maybe hurts a little bit more. You know, we've all been through situations where we're, we're scrolling through our phone or we're scrolling through Facebook and you were talking about making plans with somebody and then like the plans just fell through like nothing ever really materialized like there was this talk but nothing was ever confirmed and so you're going and and you're looking at and you're like wait a minute what are they golfing without me are they getting starbucks without me And, and so you think, and you're like, well, well, maybe I got a text, and maybe I just didn't answer. And so you go back to your text, and you start scrolling through, and, and nope, sure didn't. And you're like, well, maybe I accidentally deleted it. So you go to your deleted messages, and you're like, well, nope. And then you become like an FBI investigator, and like you start going back to the photo to look and see like, Who's in the photo? Where are they at? What time was this photo taken and posted? Where is the geotag? Like, you're going to find out what is going on. And you think, man, how could, they, how could they do that without me? How could they leave me out? I thought they were my friends. And this is a real conversation that I have heard at work before. Somebody walks into the break room And she says, hey, girl. That's that's the best girl voice I got this morning. Hey, girl. What'd what'd y'all do this weekend? And the girl's like, well, I definitely wasn't scrolling through Facebook at 1 p.m. on Saturday seeing that y'all were at Starbucks and I wanted some. (laughs) That stings. You thought these people were your friends. You thought you were included in the plans. But they left you out. There's a level of grudge with pranks. There's a a level of grudge with being left out. But maybe there's a hurt that's coming from a family member. And we all understand that that hurts just a little bit more. Maybe it was a, a mom, a dad, a sister, a brother, somebody that you loved and you trusted. They hurt you. They wronged you. Maybe it was a parent who left your family through a divorce and decided to go start a new family. And so there's some resentment and some bitterness toward that new family. Maybe it's toward a father or a mother who was never there. Maybe it's toward a a spouse or significant other who was unfaithful, leaving you to question your very existence and the value that you have on this earth. Maybe, Maybe you lost a loved one. And when they died, it felt like part of you died too. And the family gatherings, if they even happen at all, are tense and they're uneasy. Now, most of you, you know me, and, and honestly, you only know a very small part of my story. And most of you, you don't know the hurt and the bitterness that I have carried with me for years and years. And I could still tell you stories, but the hurt that I, I want to focus on is the one most recently that I have felt, and that is a bitterness toward God. Rewind back to November of 2019, the world before COVID. It's weird that you just can't get around referencing pre-COVID without mentioning COVID, and I, I hate that. But 2019, I'm, I'm at home, and I'm, I'm recovering from nasal reconstructive surgery, and I get this call from my grandmother, and she's in a panic. 
And she says, I don't know what's wrong with, with Pap. That's what I call my grandfather as Pap. I don't know what's wrong with Pap. You've got to get here. And, and so I drive and I, I break the land speed record to get to their house. And I, I rush in. And I find my grandfather lying on their bed. He's crying. He's not making any sense. He's not able to formulate thoughts or words. And y'all, I've been in healthcare since I was 18. It's, it's different when it's your family. I don't care what anybody, any medical professional says. It's, it's different when it's your family. And it was a stroke. So the squad calls, we take him in. We pray he's going to get better. Praise the Lord, he did. And then in February 7th of 2020, another stroke. It's worse. He can't talk. He doesn't know me. He doesn't know his wife. He doesn't know his great-grandchildren. And then COVID hits. Thank you, Lord. The world shuts down. Now I can't even see him. <laughs> And I felt in that moment, and you may have felt like the psalmist does in this moment, in Psalms 22, 1 through 2, this is what it says. It says, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Why are you so far from saving me, so far from my my cries of anguish? My God, I cry out day, I cry out by day, but you do not answer. By night, but I find no rest. And when you hold a grudge, you think about it more and more. And let's be honest, holding the grudge, if you play your cards right, is kind of fun and can be kind of cool, right? Because I I can go over here to Pastor Larry and I can say, man, Pastor Larry, my significant other cheated on me and and I would never do that to her and I can't believe that they did that and can you believe that they did that? And Pastor Larry goes, man, I don't like like her neither. (laughs) I I don't like them. And and then I feel good because why? Because I felt alone, but now guess what? Pastor Larry's on my side, right? And then I come over here to Megan and I go, hey, Megan, man, this girl cheated on me and she don't love me. She never loved me at all. And Megan goes, I didn't like her neither. And so she comes on my side. And then I go to like the whole Dirk Shepherd contingent because they're taking up a whole row. And I go, hey, y'all, 18 of you, guess what? This person never loved me and this person never did anything for me. And Landon Shepherd's like, yeah, man, I don't like her neither. We should write a country song about that. Like there there is some semblance of community when you walk around and you show your scars and you start getting to the point where you're proud of it. Now, it doesn't make it hurt any less, but what is the old saying? Misery loves. Let's try that again. This is the 9 a.m., and I know, like, y'all are a little older and a little sleepier. Like, let's maybe try some real coffee instead of decaf. Misery loves. Company. Company. Thank y'all. Jesus' name. I love it. But you start... You start holding on to that grudge far beyond what it's done. And we love to talk about it because even though it hurts, it keeps us fresh in somebody's mind. It gives us a sense of importance because we say, I would never do that to someone. I would never lie. I would never cheat. I would never talk about somebody. I would never leave my spouse. I would never abandon my kids. I would never post that. Sidebar on that. Y'all are worried about kids and TikTok and like Instagram and phones. Some of y'all parents are worried about parental controls on your kid's phone. Y'all need parental controls on your phone because you're posting all the garbage and that's where the kids are learning it from. So that is free. You can take that. We're gonna go back and talk about bitterness now, right? But it feels good to hold that grudge. But what ends up happening is that bitterness is like poison that you're drinking. And it is going to swallow you up before you even realize it. So the question I want to ask you this morning and the question that we're going to answer in the time that we have left together 
is what do you do with the worst stuff that happens to you? Especially when you can't stop thinking about it and when it's got a grip on you. Shoot, 2,000 years ago, people held grudges. If we look at Paul's letter to the church at Corinth in 2 Corinthians eleven twenty three, 23, he says, are they servants of Christ? I'm out of my mind to talk like this. I am more. I have worked much harder, been in prison more frequently, been flogged more severely, been exposed to death again and again. Five times I received from the Jews the 40 lashes minus one. Three times I was beaten with rods. Once I was pelted with stones. Three times I was shipwrecked. I spent a night and a day in open sea. I have been constantly on the move. I've been in danger from rivers, I've been in danger from bandits, in danger from my fellow Jews, in danger from Gentiles, in danger in the city, in danger in the country, in danger at sea, in danger from false believers. I have labored and toiled and have often gone without sleep. I have known hunger and thirst and have gone without food. I have been cold and naked. Besides everything else, I face the daily pressure of my concern for all the churches. This is Paul's reward. That is what he got for being high profile, man. How many people want that kind of fame where people literally hate you? And all the church said amen, right? So let me, let me explain it to you this way. The fame that we want since we're in church, let's talk about it in church terms. We want that Maverick City, that elevation, that Bethel kind of fame where we go fly on planes and people raise hands and hallelujah, millions of dollars. And okay, I realize I'm not talking to the church people. Let me try it this way. Young people, you want that Drake, you want that Taylor Swift, you want that Luke Combs kind of fame, all right? Let's, let's hit middle age. Middle age, you want that like Fleetwood Mac, that A. CDC, that like Elton John kind of fame. If you forgot your age, maybe you like that Bing Crosby, that Frank Sinatra kind of. Like, see, we hit everybody right there. But we want the fame where people love and adore us, right? Because if any of you are thinking about throwing rocks at me, it's going to be a minute before I forgive you. Like, we're going to have to fight. We're going to have to throw hands. I may not win, but I'm going to get a few good licks in on you. But Paul went through that and so much more. He says, I was flogged. I was stoned. I was given 40 lashes minus one, which if you're bad at math is 39, because 39 you could live through. 40 was going to kill a man. He says, I was on the run. I was shipwrecked. Literally everywhere I went, something bad happened. If there is a dude that deserves to hold a grudge and be bitter to the people that he is trying to help, my God, my God, it has to be Paul. And in one of his letters to the church at Thessalonica, Paul encourages them to live differently than the world around them. Look at what it says in 1 Thessalonians 5.15. It says, make sure that nobody pays back wrong for wrong, but always strive to do what is good for each other and for everyone else. Now, maybe you're sitting there thinking, wow, we, we went to revenge. We went to a real dark place really quick. We went from somebody didn't invite me to get starbs to now I'm sitting in a dark room and I'm plotting their demise. But I don't think that's what Paul is talking about at all. I think he's talking about breaking a cycle, a breaking a cycle that doesn't need to continue. He says, don't pay back wrong for wrong. If the person who did you wrong never apologizes, it's okay. It may not feel great. It may not feel okay. But it's okay. And you may be saying, well, they don't deserve it. Ronnie, you don't know what they've done to me. You don't know what they said to me. They haven't paid back that debt that they owe me. They haven't filled that void that they created. But Paul is telling the church, we have to live above that. We have to be better and we have to do better. And the Bible tells us we need to forgive. And, and I know if you're like me, you hear, well, the Bible says that, blah, 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 blah. Like, and then you go, yeah, the Bible says lots of things that people don't really listen to, and so why do I have to pick this? Why do I have to 
do this? What does it benefit me to forgive someone who wronged me? Why should I forgive them for talking about me, for leaving me, for taking from me, for doing that to me? Well, I want to share with you very quickly a couple reasons why. The first is forgiving someone isn't a response to an apology. We aren't forgiving in a reactionary way. Paul calls us above that. He says forgiveness is not a reaction, but it's an action all to itself. Because the longer that you carry that grudge and that bitterness, it's going to slow you down. And it's like walking while carrying a weight behind you that you were never meant to carry. And you're walking through life, and you're trying to move forward. And as you move forward, you keep looking back about what happened before. And you think, well, I've got to move forward, right? And so you drag it a little more, and then you think, well, maybe they're, maybe they're following me. Maybe they're coming to apologize. And you turn around, and you look, and, and you keep walking, and, and you keep looking, and, and you keep looking, and there's nobody there because that person may not even realize that they hurt you, or they may not even care. And you're walking, and you're struggling, and you're not going anywhere quick. And finally, out of frustration, you turn around, and you go, when are you going to apologize to me? And guess what? You're in a sound chamber because they may never. And Paul says, that's okay. He says, stop waiting on an apology to forgive someone because it may never come. Another reason why we can forgive and we can let go of bitterness is because we can forgive because we have been forgiven. We've been forgiven and we still need that forgiveness every day. We fall short, and we grieve the heart of God. That's why Jesus taught us to pray the, the part of the Lord's Prayer that we talked about the last time that we were together. And, and in Matthew chapter 6, verse 12, he says, And forgive our debts, as we have also forgiven our debtors. Not forgive us our debts so that we can forgive. Forgive us our debts as we already have forgiven. So that when we go to God and we say, God, I, I know I've done wrong, but I know that you'll forgive me. We've got to give the same thing that we're asking for. And there's a scripture that I, I've heard taken out of context more times than I can care to count. And, and usually when it's taken out of context, we, we hear it in, in money. And in Luke chapter 6, verse 38, this is, this is the verse that we hear. It says, give, and it will be given to you. A good measure, pressed down, shaken together, and running over will be poured into your lap. For with the measure you use, it will be measured to you. And like Pastor Larry said during his offering time, he said, Usually you hear about money and it's blah, 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 blah. And so you hear churches use this verse and they say, well, if you give, God is going to give you so much that you're not even going to know what to do with. And I believe in a God that, that blesses and multiplies and gives beyond measure. But I don't believe that's what Jesus was saying in this verse. Because if you rewind just one verse to Luke 6, 37, this is what it says. Do not judge and you will not be judged. Do not condemn, and you will not be condemned. Forgive, and you will be forgiven. And then we get verse 38. Jason, hit that for me. Give, and it will be given to you. A good measure pressed down. He says, in the measure that you give forgiveness, that is the measure you're going to receive forgiveness. Forgiveness. Jesus was talking about condemning, he was talking about judging, and we say, Lord, forgive me as I have already forgiven. We don't forgive as a reactionary move when somebody's finally checked enough boxes and met enough quotas to earn our forgiveness, because man, y'all, we're wasting our time if we've got to earn God's forgiveness, I don't know if that's where you're at, if you think you've got to earn love and forgiveness, but let me dispel that from you right now. 
because try as you might, you never will. And thank God for that. So I want to pause too. I, I want to say this. As we're talking about bitterness and grudges, I, I don't want you to think something and I don't want you to go out of here saying, well, Ronnie said that, and then you're going to send emails say, well, Ronnie said that. This is not what I'm saying. I am not saying that if you are in a situation of abuse of any kind, that you should stay in that. That is not what I am saying at all. If you are in a situation where there is physical, there is mental, there is emotional, there is sexual abuse, I am not saying stay in that. That is illegal, that is immoral, and that is disgusting to God. I am not saying stay in a situation like that. If you are in a situation like that, I'm sure there are ways that we can get you set up to get help to get out of those situations. So if you are in one of those situations today, do not leave here thinking that forgiveness means you need to go back to that abuse and say, well, this honors God. Because I'll tell you, I've heard sermons preached about that, and it's wrong. God is not okay with that. God does not ordain those things to happen. And if you think that he does, I would love to have a conversation with you about who God really is. Because the God I know is a God of love. He is a God of forgiveness. He is a God of truth. He is a God of mercy. He is a God of peace. He is not a God who delights in me persevering through my torment. And so if you find yourself in that situation, find one of the staff pastors this morning, find somebody on our prayer team, and we would love not to just pray for you, but we would love to get you set up and connected to people who can help you. But what I am saying is that forgiveness and bitterness is not something that you should bear alone. Another thing is forgiveness frees you from burden. Again, forgiveness frees you from burden. Now, I'm not saying that there won't be hurt. I'm not saying that there won't be pain in your situation. But you will carry this grudge and be angry with someone. And when you finally let, you just let it go you can finally move forward in the next step, which is healing what is going on inside of you. And you can't do that while your focus is still behind you. You can't walk forward. You can't run for what God has for you if you're still concerned with what happened before. You keep thinking about, well, next time I see them, I'll say this or I'll do this. You're waking up in the middle of the night thinking, man, I want to call them right now and just give them a piece of my mind. I want to tell them what I really think about them. If that's you, you're carrying around something that you were never meant to carry. If something is eating away at you inside right now and you can't just seem to be happy no matter how hard you try, bitterness is weighing you down. The last thing I want to share with you today is that unforgiveness can keep us stuck while forgiveness moves us forward. Earlier, I told you about my grandfather and the, the situation that happened. We kind of left it on a cliffhanger. And uh, Daniel, if, if you want to come and help me with keys or if Todd wants to come help me with keys, that'd be awesome as we wrap up. But as my grandfather's his condition got worse and worse. I watched the toll it took on him, and then I watched the toll and the strain that it put on my family. I watched the strain that it put on my grandmother. I watched the strain that it put on my parents as they coped with what was happening and trying to move in and help take care of him. I, I saw the strain that it that put on my sister and my, my brother-in-law and how they navigated that with now four young children, three of who knew my, my grandfather before his stroke, and they're six years old. They don't understand why he doesn't know who they are. 
And I watched as my best friend since the time I was five years old forgot who he was. I watched as he forgot where he was. I, for, I watched as he forgot who I was. And I took that pain and I buried it so far deep because I had to carry everyone. Because when all hell was breaking loose, it was my job to hold things together. When something goes wrong, who does your grandmother call, Ronnie? Well, she calls me. When your dad needs help getting your grandfather around the house, who does he call? Well, he calls me. And I told y'all this was going to be for, for me just as much as it was for you today. So if you don't do well with emotions, come back again next week and we'll, we'll hope Pastor Larry doesn't cry. <laughs> and I had to believe that God was going to do something because I was the one who went to Bible college. I was the one who volunteered at church. And I had to believe that God was going to do something until he didn't. And on February 28th, 2021, I was seated right over here, in the middle of a worship night. I was sitting right where Anthony's sitting this morning when I found out that my grandfather died. And I hated it. Because I felt everything at once and I felt nothing at all. Because that hurt got so deep down inside of me that I had mourned and I had already grieved for two years as I watched him suffer. And for the next year, I carried that bitterness inside of me. When I got hired on staff, I carried that bitterness inside of me. I'll pull back the curtain. We're human too. And I, I'm not proud of it, but so many days I woke up and I said, God, what the hell are we doing? What's good in this? How are you honoring in this? How do I honor you in this? What do I do with this? And I was angry. And I didn't know what to do. I wasn't telling you. I wasn't showing you. I'm ashamed to tell you this story today. But so many times when I was praying for you in the back of my mind, I was, God, you're not going to do anything. You didn't do anything for me. What are you going to do for them? No, it's not to mean that my prayers weren't earnest for you, but it's hard to walk through this. I know I'm not the first person. I'm not the last person to lose a loved one. I understand that. These aren't bitter grapes. This isn't the lamenting of a young man. <laughs> but shortly after my grandfather passed, uh, I met a beautiful woman who in about 190 some days I am going to stand with on our wedding day. And it's going to be amazing. But you know what's going to suck? I'll tell you this, because I've already told her this. There's going to be empty chairs there that I don't want there. My dad's parents that I lost when I was so young, I, I barely remember them. And my, my grandfather's chair that I always imagined would be filled. And if Andrea and I are, are blessed to have children... They'll never know him. I'm jealous 
of my nieces that they got to spend time with their great-grandfather. And you may think less of me for that, but I, I want my kids to, I wanted my kids to know him, and they can't. <laughs> and it wasn't until last September when Andrea and I were in the Upper Peninsula for vacation, I was going to propose. She had no idea. She swears she knew, but she didn't. <laughs> and the night before, I, I woke up, and I made sure I, I didn't wake her up. And I, I walked out to Lake Michigan, and I, I took a paddleboard out into the middle of, of open water in the middle of the night, which isn't smart, so please don't do that. And I went out there to argue with God. And I said, God, I, I can't do this. I can't be a good husband. I can't be a good father with this bitterness. So either you've got to go or I've got to go, and I'm darn sure not ready to go yet. And I sat out there and I argued with God while the waves kind of moved me back and forth. And in the middle of the night, sitting and shivering on Lake Michigan, it hit me. The whole time I'm looking back about what God took for me, I've missed the beauty of what he added. I was so fixated on the broken relationships and the broken situations and the things that God took from me that I missed what he gave me to replace it. I'm angry about relationships and people who left me. And I've missed the potential of what Andrea and I could build for our family as we start anew. I'm angry about the opportunities that I, I felt like I've missed and I was passed over. Or, and I've missed the potential that we have to work in our vocations and the ability that we have to serve here with you guys. I'm angry about the best friend that God took from me. And I've missed the potential for me to be the best part about a loved one who is gone. People can still come to know my grandfather through me. He shared the best parts of who he was with us. And for better or worse, that's why I am the way that I am, and that's why I carry the name that I carry. And as you look back, you are missing everything else that is happening. While you were looking back at the hurt, while you were looking back at the pain, while you were looking back at the loss, you are missing the way God is moving and what he wants to do in and through you. You are missing, you are missing open doors and you are missing pathways that God wants to take you down. But if you are so busy looking back, holding burdens that you just won't let go of, you'll never see them. God wants to use you, each and every one of you in this room and watching online in a major, major way. But it is tough for God to use you to move forward and build his kingdom if you're always looking back. Let go to move forward. You don't have to reconcile with that person that has wronged you or hurt you. You don't have to be best friends. But you have to move past it for your sake. And who knows, the sake of others that you may impact as you move forward. Have you ever felt like God doesn't hear you? That your voice hits the ceiling like the heavens are closed? I've felt that way too. Hello. My name is Josh Pennington, and I would love to share with you how I navigated the dry seasons of life in my brand new book called When the Heavens Seem Closed. You can get this book anywhere that books are sold, online or at morelifechurch.com. I would love for you to plan a visit to worship with us any Sunday morning at 9 a.m. or 11 a.m. at More Life Church.